the uh, Christmas carols originally started uh, because most folks were illiterate. They, they couldn't, couldn't read, couldn't write, and so they wanted folks to be able to remember the Christmas story and what it was all about, and so they put it to song. As a matter of fact, it's one of the main differences between older music and modern, uh, especially church music, is that the older uh, music, one of the reasons it's, it's, there's all these stanza and, it, and it's a little bit more dense, I guess, in meaning is because um, that was the best way to teach and to get people to remember is you taught them a song. And so throughout the week, they could remember what was taught and, and, the, and the truth to scripture in the song. We have so much, act we read and write now for most of us. You have the internet, you can look things up, you can uh, listen to a teacher anytime you want, at any time of day through the internet. So most of our songs are written for an experience to come in the modern era, to come and it's part of the experience where before it was really uh, part of the, the teaching. Not that both aren't represented in each um, era. But it's always interesting to kind of see what the motivation is uh, behind the music that we sing. And, and um, it's especially true, or it's also true, I guess you'd say, of, of our carol today, Do You Hear what I hear. Um, and like you, I've always, I, you know, it's, it's a great song. I love to hear it. It just kind of brings about uh, great and easy feelings. But it, it actually has an unusual story behind it. It was written by uh, Noel Regney with the music by his wife, Gloria Shane Baker. And what's unusual about this actually is that uh, Noel and Gloria uh, wrote popular uh, pop tunes, if you would, in the 50s, most of which most of y'all probably don't know. Um, but normally, um, Gloria did the writing of the, mu of the lyrics, and Noel, her husband, actually then did the music. But uh, this was a unique time. It was in the early uh, 60s, and there was something going on historically, which um, uh, most of us probably only know by hearing uh, history. A few of you may, may uh, know a little bit more, more of experience, called the Cuban Missile Crisis. And um, you, you can basically summarize, summarize it this way. Um, uh, Russia wanted to get nuclear weapons closer to America, basically to scare America because America had put nuclear weapons close to them. And Cuba was a willing participant wanting to kind of stand up to America to say, hey, you can put them on our country. And then we uh, sent some ships uh, to make sure that no more missiles at least got to Cuba. And there was this highly tense uh, moment. Um, matter of fact, for those of you who are a little worried between what's happening now with, with the head of our country and the head of North Korea, this is actually light compared to the Cuban Missile Crisis and the tension that was felt during that day and time. And so Noel and his wife Gloria were on the streets of New York City in 1962. And uh, they were a little knotted up about um, the holiday season, Thanksgiving, and Christmas that was coming up, and the reality that uh, they were teaching kids how to get under desks and how to respond in case of a nuclear war. And what struck Noel was the, specifically the look on little kids' faces who were in the strollers that moms were pushing down the streets of New York City. And it inspired him to write this song, Do You Hear? what I hear. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, even though uh, Noel and uh, Gloria would uh, later divorce, Gloria looked back on this time with fondness. And she's quoted an article saying that Noel, her husband, wrote a beautiful song. Uh, Baker uh, said in an interview, she said this, she said, I wrote the music. She said, but we couldn't sing it. Our little song broke us up. And then she said, you must realize that there was a threat of nuclear war at the time. And so when they write this little cute little ditty, the, the truth is, is, is it, it, was, it was written from a place of fear. It was wrote, written from a place of brokenness. It was written from a place of, of we really do desire peace on earth. The goal is to move to a place of understanding. The goal is to move to a place to experience God's light and goodness but there's a progression to get there so as you see in the the first stanza so the night went to the little lamb it starts with do you see what i see 
And then the next stanza is the little lamb goes to the shepherd board. It goes from do you see to you hear what I hear. And then the shepherd board says in the mighty king in the third stanza, do you know what I know? It's a, it's, it gets a little bit more intimate each time from seeing to hearing to knowing. So that in the last stanza, which is really what they desire, which is really the whole point of the song, where the king says to the people everywhere, pray for peace. Not generally, not ethereally, not, hey, it's holiday time, just pray for peace. No, it's, it's uh, we're going to be, on, we're on the verge of nuclear war. Pray for peace, people everywhere. And then going back to the child and the, and the very purpose of that little manger scene that kind of laid before the kids here, for God will bring us goodness and light, which is really the intent of the song. The intent of the song to get to, is to get to the place where the world is filled not with fear, but with goodness. And it's filled with light in the darkness. But in order to get there, there needs to be a seeing, and there needs to be a hearing, and there, ultimately there needs to be a knowing so that people can experience the peace that comes from God's goodness and light. And, and in fact, in our passage uh, this week, we kind of see the same uh, progression, if you would. So last week... Um, we went through this part of the story where the angels, of all people, come to the shepherds. They go to unexpected uh, people at an unexpected time. They tell them about an expected Messiah who's in an unexpected place, in, a, in an unexpected condition. And after the shepherds hear the story, we pick up this uh, week. It says, When the angels had left them and gone to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And once they, once they heard it, they said, man, we, it's something we need to go and see. We've heard, we need to see this thing that, that we've heard about, that the Lord has told us about. They didn't just say, you know what, that was a great message from the angels, but we got sheep to take care of. We got economics, we got families to worry about, we got, we got things to do. This is, a, this is a busy season, and they were coming up actually upon a busy season. All those lambs were needed for all the folks that would be coming. But yet they left that in order to go and see for themselves what they had heard about. And so, verse 16, they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger, just like they had heard. And when they had seen him, then they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. They didn't just hear about it from the angels and go about their business and then, and then say, hey, you know what? The angels told us. They were like, okay, we heard about it. So what? We've got to go see him for ourselves. And once they, they heard it, once they saw it, they knew the child, as much as you can know a child at that particular stage. And then they shared. And they didn't just share their experience, but they, they shared what the angels told them, the, the significance of it. But it was, it was more significant, if you would. It was something worth sharing because it was something that they had experienced. It was someone that they now knew. They now knew the child. When they saw, they knew. And then they shared it with others. And of course, Mary treasured these things up in her heart. And this, this whole idea of knowing is actually huge. It's, it's gigantic when it comes to experiencing God and this whole thing that we call faith. In John chapter 17, Christ is getting, preparing his disciples for his leaving, for his death and resurrection and then ascension into heaven and the birth of the church. And so he's teaching them. And then after teaching them in 14, 15, and 16, starting chapter 17, he says a prayer. It says, after Jesus said this, teaching his disciples, he looked toward heaven and he prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. The interesting thing here is 
He's saying, hey, the time's come for me to be glorified. But in order for him to be glorified, you know what happened to happen first? Death on the cross. Death on the cross. For, for those of us who are following Christ, mark that one down. God's got great things for us, but sometimes there's a cross between us and that. We're actually going to talk about that in our series in the new year. Verse 2, for you granted him, being Jesus, authority over all people, that he might uh, give eternal life to all those uh, you have given him. What this talks about, this talks about the purpose of why Christ came to earth. Jesus understanding. This is Jesus' prayer to the Father. You want to know how he uh, thought about his time on earth? It's right here. And, and, it, and it goes way beyond, you know, hey, God, you sent me here to be a good example. It goes way beyond, hey, God, you sent me here, you know, to, to show everybody that all you need is love. He says, no, you, God, you, you had a, a purpose. You gave me authority, and it was part of the plan. There are specific people that are yours, and you want them to experience eternal life. Jesus was sent specifically that we, that others would have eternal life. And then, really importantly, in verse 3, Jesus is going to give the definition of eternal life. Now, this, is, this is better than Webster. Better than going to the dic dictionary. And Jesus says it specifically. What, what do you mean, Jesus, by eternal life? And he says in verse 3 here, Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. My whole reason for coming is that folks may have eternal life, and this is eternal life. A lot of times we think of it in terms of eternal life is kind of like um, Disneyland. It's, it's the happiest place on earth. And, and the outside world looking in, they, a lot of times that's the way they think of, of heaven. That's the way they think of, of eternal life is is it's a reward for you know, those folks who think that they're really good. They go to the good place, and everybody else goes to the bad place. But that's not what Jesus says. He says, this is eternal life. Here's my destiny of eternal life. It's knowing God. And if that's too ethereal for you, that's too distant for you, God made himself flesh in the Son, Jesus. And therefore, knowing God is to know Jesus who is the Christ. That is eternal life. And if you're following this at all, it's, uh, hopefully a light bulb will go on or, or, or you'll be reminded that, that we often think eternal life is to come, but by this definition, it's not. Eternal life begins the moment you begin to know God. The way I described it as first service is it, it, it's kind of like um, you... Get, are just getting a taste right now. You're just, if you would, if you're going to Disneyland, it's kind of like you're walking into Main Street. You haven't got to the main event yet, but you're walking to Main Street. You're at least in the gates. And the, and the moment you come to God and, and you know you're fully received, you're his son, you're his daughter, because of what Christ did on your behalf, at that moment that you know him like that, you, eternal life has begun. And it all flows from knowing God. Now, the interesting thing is, is uh, um, the Lord in his infinite wisdom kind of gave me a, um, a personal example, an experience of this just, just yesterday. We, uh, um, our family uh, has moved from one rental home to, a, to another, and, and he just provided a wonderful place, really close to the old place that we, we had lived. And so uh, we decided to kind of have an open house or a housewarming party. And so those of you on Facebook, you saw our invitation to the church. But we also invited our, our neighbors. And we had probably, I don't know exactly how many, but let's just say a dozen so or neighbors of, of folks that live in our neighborhood come by in, in a span of about four hours on and off, as well as our church family, to just see the house and kind of get to know them. And um, I'm, I'm still walking a little bit, if you would, on, on a relational cloud nine, if you would. It was different pulling out of our neighborhood this morning because just a day or two ago, 
it was a it was a house, a place that we lived that we were very thankful for, but it was just that one little corner. But now, as as I was pulling out, there there are, I can look at homes. It was too early to see anybody on the street, but I can look at homes, and later on, I can see folks walking down the street, and I know their stories, and and now. It really feels like a neighborhood in the best sense of neighborhood, not just a place that your house happens to be, but, but a, a interconnected relational place where people kind of watch out for each other. And we have a long way to go. They were just initial inter introductions, but it just changed the nature of, of where we are and how we live life. I look for excuses now to kind of to kind of go out and, and see who I can see on the street. And it makes life richer. It, it, it even makes it richer, I, I, I know for some folks who, who were able to kind of see our thing on, on Facebook and they kind of come over to house to see where the pastor lives. You get one view, right, like this, but it's a whole other thing when you get to see how somebody lives and you kind of do life when you begin to get to know them. It becomes real. It becomes intimate. It becomes special. And that's what it's like to know God. So real briefly, I want to talk about what, what are some of the ways to get to know God. And it's the same thing as with people. The first is, and this is in your notes too, is, is to read or listen to his word. One of the, that was one of the, the fundamental first steps as everybody came over is you begin to learn their stories, right? You may, uh, you may see a home, you're driving down your block and you, and you might see a home and everybody else's house is lit up, but this house is dark. And you either, you hardly ever see the folks there, things maybe don't look as, as kept up or whatever it may be. And then you get an opportunity to meet the neighbor and hear their story. And you find out some of the reasons why you know, it could be a bad back or the, the, the reason the lights aren't up and how they used to go all out or, or what, whatever their family situation is, they always go to their grandkids or whatever for Christmas. And, and, all, and all of a sudden you have a different view of that dark, what seemed lifeless house because you know the person there and you know their story. And that's what God's word is for us. There's a lot revealed about him by just learning his story learning how much he cares, learning how much his, his heart is also the things that, that, that bother you, your own brokenness and the things that are done to you bother God as well. You have to guess at that. If you know his story, if you know his word, if you're, if you're a, a participant in that, you, know, you begin to know God more and more because you know how much he loves, you know how much he hurts, you know what he cares about and that you're it. And, and the great thing about story, uh, God's story, too, is the more you read it, the more you get into it, the more you realize the worse off you are, the least likely you are to be loved, the higher on God's list you seem to be. We think it disqualifies us, but if you know God's story, you understand that actually super qualifies you. I don't get it because I'm broken and fallen like you. But that's true. But you gotta hear it, you gotta take that in. The second thing is to talk to God in prayer and listen. It was the same thing. It was one of the beautiful things about yesterday was people just talking and sharing. And, and uh, I was just sharing with somebody in the hallway right before this service how wonderful it is, A, to connect with our neighbors, but also uh, there, you know, there were several of them there. And while I was connecting with one and Lynn was connecting with the other, there were several folks from our church family that were connecting with. with with our neighbors and getting to know them. Even the folks who own the home showed up and, and uh, uh, um, got to stay for a while and fellowship and tell their story and be heard and make connections. And there's something about two-way conversation. And a prayer life is part of that, but you probably heard me say this several times, but I want to reiterate it. A healthy prayer life is, is not actually best represented by what we do on Sunday morning a prayer before a meal, or like a monk who you know prays all day. That's actually not the best representation of a healthy prayer life. To me, if you wanted to picture the perfect picture of a healthy prayer life, 
it would be a teenager and their phone. <laughs> Just think about a teenager and their phone. They're constantly on it all the time. If there's, if there's a lull in the, in, in the schedule, right? If they don't know what to do with 30 seconds of their life, they got to go to their phone. They're waiting in line, they're on their phone. Unfortunately, they're driving, they're on their phone. They're at the dinner table, they're on their phone, if you let them have it. And, and the other, and other thing about a teenager in the phone is, is if something exciting happens, they got to call or text and tell someone. They got to take a picture. But you know what? If something boring is going on, they, gotta, they, gotta, they call and tell their friends, I'm bored. They have a great meal. They take a picture. They want to talk about it. They have hot dogs and baked beans. They want to talk about it with their friends. And that's what a healthy, healthy prayer life really is. It's just a conversation with God saying, this is what's going on. This is what I like. This is what I don't like. I got a spare moment. Well, might as well talk to God. I got something exciting going on. Thank you, God. Nothing's going on. Hey, God, nothing's going on. You got anything going on on your end? Whatever. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's just a simple conversation. It's about building relationships and it's about listening. And let me, for those of you who are really new to the faith and maybe you haven't established a relationship with God, God rarely, there are occasions I've heard of, but it's very, very rare where there's actually an audible voice. It's more like the experience of Elijah where it says that God spoke to Elijah in a still, small voice. It's, it's, it's your conscience. It's, it's that, it's a, a, it's a nudge. It's, it's just, you've got to learn how to listen to God, but he does speak. And that's how you get to know him. The next way is to fellowship with his people. And that's part of gathering, but it's not just gathering and we go to church together, but it's, it's, it's actually listening to other people's stories of God. For instance, um, I, I have an unusual, maybe it's not an unusual family in this day and age, but my family's a mix, mixture of his and hers. So my dad had kids before, my mom had had a child before, and then they got married, and we had this mish, mish pot. And my dad was in his 40s when I was born. So he had lived a lot of life. And he had also parented, he had a hand in parenting eight other kids before I came around. Right, so I had one experience with my father, but it's always interesting to sit down with my older brothers and sisters. By the way, my oldest brother is 25 years older than me. It's always interesting to sit down with him and ha have him tell me stories. Because my dad was in his 20s when he parented my oldest brother. And I get to know him in a different way. And some of the good things get gooder. I know that's not a word, but just, just go with me. And then there's some aspects of my father that he learned that he wasn't so good at. But by the time I came around, I get thankful because I'm like, oh, I'm glad I didn't get that aspect of daddy. But you learn more about someone when you hear about them from another perspective, from other people. So I think it's great when we come together and you talk about your holiday plans and you talk about your favorite sports team. You talk about the business. You talk about politics. I think that's all great. But don't forget to tell your experience with God to one another. Because that's how we get to know him better, to hear other people talk about him as well. And then lastly, tell others about him. Tell others about God. Now, I know some of you, especially if you're church, you're like, oh, I, I, I know. The pastor's always got to throw an evangelistic, evangelize, go tell people thing in there. Actually, this, is, this really is about knowing God. Because there's, there's an aspect, probably the best example I, I can give you is this. This is especially true with people who have moved away or if have passed away. The best way to keep them close, to keep them alive, is to tell others about them. Yeah. Tell others the story about my daddy, who died, who died when I was 23 years old. To tell, to tell stories about a, a lost loved one or, or, or your children who are gone or whatever it may be. It, it, it keeps them alive and it solidifies them. And if you want to stay close to God, share him with others. It also, by the way, clarifies some things for you. And at least in my own life, I find that uh, when I share God, th there, 
There are things that I believe are true, there are things that I know are true, and there's things that I'm unsure of. And sometimes if I just sit down in the quietness of my head, I don't know the difference between those three categories. But when I begin to share with others, the things I really believe, I feel like I can share. And the things I'm like, eh, I kind of shy away from sharing those aspects because I'm still wrestling over them myself. So when you tell about God to others, you, you A, draws you closer, it reminds you of his goodness and his work in your life, but B, too, it kind of clarifies how well you do or you do not know him. And it, again, it's just like any other relationship. The miracle of Christmas starts with the understanding that the babel, baby in the manger was the light of the world. He was the light of the world, God entering the darkness that we might come to know him, which is eternal life. Our first step toward eternal life includes realizing that we don't have it. And this is kind of the experience for a lot of people on Christmas, right? They, they, they walk by the Christmas store window that's all decorated and it shows what Christmas could be, and they're sad because they don't have that. You drive by a neighbor's home and maybe they have the, the meal out and the Christmas tree up, and you, you're sad because you realize, I don't have that. It actually begins there. Our first step is understanding we don't have it initially. It's a sense of separation, rebellion, lostness, or inadequacy before God. The Bible calls it sin. It's a brokenness, a separation. But there is hope that separation and lostness is not permanent. There is a hope. And it comes from hearing, seeing, and knowing God, and then that light that personal light, not something you heard, not something you see in others, not even something you heard from the pastor, but of experience begins to come alive in your own heart and light. The light of the world isn't just a message of peace on earth, but it's a real opportunity to know the light, to know the light of the world, to know Emmanuel, which is God with us. Do you know the light? Do you have eternal life? Do you know the light? 